we are going to talk about how to build a, su a successful team. Um, and I talked to, I think it was, um, was here, and Shuk, you said you, you're coming for uh, thinking about how can we build a successful team for a different area. So I'm focusing on examples from product, but I do think a successful team is the base for everything. Uh, and I also want to say uh, that although I was focusing on my professional life in PayPal, uh, I had some, you probably read this, but I have some experience from the Israeli and state intelligence unit where there you can't really choose the people uh, you work with, uh, but you really need to have everyone's you know, mind on the mission. So we will talk of, of some examples from there of what can we take to bring, to make people work together as a team. Um, one other thing I want to I want to say before um, before we start is that many of the things we'll talk about today is common sense. You're not going to leave this room saying, "Oh my God, I can't do it." You just said that, but it does require a lot of small effort every day in order to build a team. A team is not something. What I want to say, the main main point is, the team is not something that is that just happening. We need to invest time in order for it to happen and happen successfully. Now, I do want to say um, that besides being you know, a professional product manager, I'm also a mother for three, and I'm currently on my maternity leave. So this is as close to a party that I had in the last five months, and it's really important for me that you will be part of this party, okay? So I'll try to make it conversational, and I will need your help. Um, we might need to take some time from the Q&A, depending on how many questions you have, okay? But let's give it a try and start. We're going to start from why even bother, why it's still really important. And then we'll talk about the common dysfunctions and things that we see uh, that hurt the, the potential of the team. And then we'll give some practical tips that I found working well for me. And of course, feel free to add from yours as well. So one thing that I noticed is that there are two very interesting trends that are conflicting in today's world. On one hand, the world is becoming much more complicated, right? Things are changing, they're dynamic, and it's true for work and personal life as well. And we find out that things are, you know, all the people would love to say that there is no one person that can solve a problem on his or own. Or own. Right? We need to work together as a group to solve problems. But on the other hand, um, there is a lot of research showing that there is a decrease in our ability to empathize and in our ability to work together as a team. So people that were born in the late 90s, I'm sure some of you are here hiding in the room, it's not personal, but because uh, those folks were born, I'm not part of them unfortunately, but because they were born uh, with technology in their hand, they're less, you know, their tendency is less to collaborate. And of course, it's not one person, it's overall the generation. But think about it, by 2020, which is not that far away, they will be a third of the US population, which means it will have great impact on the way we work, but also on our lives, right? So with those two conflicting trends, we need to think about how, what can we do to help teams work together. And you can see this beautiful team over here is, just for it to sound less vague, I want to give you a, an example. In 2015, PayPal acquired Zoom. Uh, have you ever used Zoom? Yeah? Well, that's a lot of people. That's better than even product managers or people think we, can, we should work together as a team. So, um, Zoom was acquired by PayPal and I was part of the integration team. Our job, our main, main goal initial goal was to make sure that we can enable PayPal users to send money to their friends and family abroad using um, using Zoom product via PayPal. Now think about it, you take two teams, uh, Zoom and PayPal, and you need for them to work together on this funnel, um, but they don't use the same language, they use different KPIs, and sometimes they even use the same language to describe a different KPI. So luckily, and I'm talking about folks that work in different sites in the US and also in Europe, uh, the team was able to increase the conversion in the funnel in 400% in two sprints. And for those of you who are not product manager, we're talking about a month. And I want to give you some examples of how we did it. Before that, before we jump into how do we fix it, let's start from what's broken, okay? 
So what is a performing, um, what, what, what does a high performing team look like? I'm sure you're part of some, right? So give me some examples. Yes, and if you can share your name, I'll try to remember. So can handle conflict in a productive way. What else? Great communication. And your name? Yeah. Maria. We have two Maria. Yes. Trust. Trust. I can go home. I'm um, thank you for coming, but I think we're done. And your name? Bakesh. Bakesh. Yes. Be innovative. Excuse me? Be innovative. Be innovative. Yes. Very good. Okay. Super platform when they have it now when they are trying to talk. Exactly. So not pointing uh, problems, not pointing fingers at each other, trying to solve problems together. Yes. A common goal. Perfect. So I was looking for. Uh, by by the way, this side's win this time. You can try that next time uh, for this side. Uh, when I was thinking about the best picture to describe how does a good performing team look like for me, is this great PR team? Although we are a little less sexy, I think, in our product team. Uh, but this is a great example, right? People who work together toward the same common goal, the responsibility is super important. And also, they are highly dependent on each other and they have to be adaptable in order to help people survive, right? So after we talked about where we want to be, how does a high performing team look like? What are the main dysfunctions? This software thing too. So we started from a computer, now this. Oh, ta-da, okay. So what are the main dysfunctions that you ran into with your team? Things that make you feel you want to kill someone. <laughs> In a good way. Yeah. I'll give you a minute to think about it. I'm going to bring something from my bed. Yes. Any idea? Not everyone does his part. Not everyone, not everyone is doing their part. Okay. So miscommunication, what are the expectations? Like? Deliverable of the tasks. Deliverable of the tasks. Or that groups of skill set as well as understanding of the goal. Perfect. So skill set and understanding of the goal. The team coordination is not. What What do you mean by team coordination? Um, team members and relationship. Relationship between the team members. Okay. I just I really want to give opportunity to this side because you're lagging far far behind. So Ryan, help us here. So it's been a kind of dance around it, but it, um, responsibilities and people on the team, so just what, how, talk uh -huh. talks about it. Mm -hmm. Great. So responsibility of the team, who talks to you, how, we'll talk more about this. Focus on the problem, set up the solution, one that just thinks about the problem, doesn't want to solve the problem, just the point. So when you have a bunch, bunch of product managers together, you put them in the room, they talk about the problem, they wait for someone else to solve it. Yes. Yeah, that's a big problem. Yes. So working in, not working in the most efficient way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your name? Kevin. Kevin. Ryan? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yes. Vision between like team members, different team members have different goals and different priorities. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yes. So Ryan was talking about different visions different purpose, you know, we work toward a different purpose, a different idea of what the team needs to do. So that answer is point, conflicting roadmap priorities. Yes, conflicting roadmap priorities. Lack of motivation. <laughs> Lack of motivation, very, very basic, and I agree with you. So, as you can see, there are many dysfunctions, and I don't know about you, product managers will love frameworks, and maybe will love frameworks too, although you're not a product manager. So I want to offer you a great book, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it now. Uh, but that's the five dysfunctions of a team. And uh, by I will never pronounce his name right, but he will have to forgive me. Patrick Lencioni, I think that's his name. That's a great book. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to use everything you've said, and I'm going to talk just summarize it quickly before we move into solutioning. 
Okay? So the number one important thing is trust. And you mentioned it, right? So it's I'm not talking about trust that I trust you to do your job right. I've seen you do the job before. I'm talking about real trust. When people can feel vulnerable, when they want to share their strength with one another, when they're open to give feedback because they know no one will screw them over later, right? So this is a very basic thing that has to be uh, has to be there in order for a team to be successful. And, and we'll talk later about what can we do to make team members feel more, you know, trust, feel more trust among each other. The second thing is fear of conflict, and I think I can't remember, but someone here mentioned it, right? When, uh, by the way, we will share the slides and all the notes. Uh, I invested a lot of time in the note writing, so you won't have to write, uh, but your choice. Um, so, fear on, of conflict. When people are not arguing, what are they doing? Back channeling. Back channeling. So, we always have different opinions, right? If we're not sharing those opinions, it means we're going and talking about someone else behind their back. And so when we don't see conflict with the team, there is something called the artificial harmony. Everything will try, it seems like we all agree, but actually it means that I don't want to tell you how I really feel. And conflict is what helps us grow. It's what helps us get to the best solution out there, right? Because if I'm only sharing my opinion and Hanush doesn't feel like wanting to share his, then we'll stay with my boring solution and we can grow on top of each other. Then, if there is no trust and no conflict, we are going to a lack of commitment. In order to get commitment, what do we need? One is we need clarity, right? You were talking here about um, understanding the goals, understanding where we're heading, so this is one. And the second thing is buying. I don't know about you, but PayPal, um, and I think Kelvin mentioned it, right? roadmaps that are conflicting. There is a lot going on at PayPal, right? They're not running only one product, and even if we do, even in, in you know, a small startup that runs only one product, still, you know, there is marketing and risk and, and, and designers, and every, every, t every person has its opinion, his opinion, but also every team has their goals. And one of the things we're seeing is that people that are, you know, normal people, people that are, you know, I guess, yeah, normal is, good, is a good way to describe it, are not expecting to get it their way each and every time, right? They understand sometimes it will be my way, sometimes it will be your way, but they do want to get hurt. And that's another third very important thing. In order to get commitment, we have to get everyone to share their opinions. And then there's accountability. Accountability means that actually we, are, we, we want to do it right. We're not doing it just for the job. And just to make it more, accountability can be, you know, I, uh, I don't care. But it can also be just a matter of going back to this Generation Z that I was talking about. I had a very interesting conversation with a developer. You know, we had our Scrum, Scrum meeting and we were about to launch. I was asking him if something is ready on the website. And he said, yes, of course. Show it to me. Oh, I can show it to you because I've done my piece. So it doesn't mean it's ready. No, what about this other guy's piece? And he said, oh, I don't know, I, I slept him. Did you talk to him? Of course, I texted him. Well, texting is not talking to friends. And this is something, and hey, please join us. And this is something we are missing today. And this is all driving us far away from our ability to get to results. So we talked about all those dysfunctions. Yes? What I'm missing here, and it relates to what you mentioned about the, the children of the 90s and about um, is the what's in it for me. Like we're living today in a world where the reason he like he could align the fact, this is what you mentioned, that if the other guy finishes his task, he also needs right? So where does that fit? So I have to say, so Patrick doesn't talk about it. I truly, so I'll just repeat to make sure everyone heard. And uh, what's your name? Beth. Beth. So Beth is talking about what's in it for me. And I have to say, I know the literacy is talking about how generations are getting more focused about what's in it for me in the job environment. But I have to say that a lot of what I've seen is actually people do want to feel part of something bigger than themselves. They want to contribute. So I know 
there's a lot of conversations around what's in it for me, what am I getting out of it, but I truly believe this person, by the way, is one of the best developers I've seen. Uh, it's almost like being a, you know, um, a handicap, he's missing a capability. No one ever told him that in order to get real good result, you have to go up. I'm talking about someone that is one floor, one floor above. So go, go out there and just talk to him to get better results. Uh, I do agree that it's, it's relevant though, but not to the example that I, that I provided, okay? It depends on the workflow. Everybody understands what we're asked about. And there is such a thing as public information. It's many people. It's not to the other side. It's not to the other side. It's not to the other side. So it's all predicated on certain work. Any earnings? So Stephen is saying it's part of the workflow. It depends on do we want to get, uh, do we want, do we really want to get everyone talking to everyone? And I agree. It depends on what you want to do, but I will say that I do think sometimes, or most of the time, the problem is lack of communication, where people, because, you know, remember, I don't know if you were here at the beginning when I said the problems are getting more and more complicated, there is no one person that can solve them, and I do think that in order for people to be successful, they have to communicate together, and they have to solve the problem together. In this specific example that I gave, um, the person was responsible for getting something ready for launch. And in order to get something ready for launch, you have to talk to other folks. I agree with you that there are some cases where it's, it's a different scenario. You don't want many people talking to, you know, to many people. Yes, I'm going to make it harder, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Because the what's in it for me is, could be like, why should I be a part of this team? It doesn't mean what's in it for me as an individual, but why does this team need to succeed and then how do I get it for because this example of the guy who wouldn't go upstairs, mm -hmm. he needs to want to go upstairs. I completely agree. And we'll get to it in a second. Okay? So, um, we now, after, I mean, I hope now if I ask the question, who thinks we need to invest in team building, everyone will raise their hand, right? Because we don't have a lot of time, and I hope you're convinced, and we can move into how we're going to do it. Um, Many times when people think about team building, they're thinking, oh, we'll go out for pizza and beer, which is great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. We should definitely go out for pizza and beer. But what I want to do now is I want to give you a few examples of things that I've done that worked, doesn't take a lot of your time, and it's definitely something you can do while still running and chasing and hitting and exceeding KPIs, okay? Um, I do want to say that um, we talked about it over dinner, me and my dear family, and um, my son said, oh, I know how to do teams, what's the problem? He went away, came back, gave me this piece of paper, and I said, I have to do it there. So you all have to listen to what this seven-year-old son said. He said, what's the problem? Just pick people that know how to work together, they will become the leaders, and they, the cycle will go on, right? All you have to do is just to choose those folks that know how to work together. But then we all know that in reality, we don't really choose the people we work with all the time, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to dive into a few tools that are going to help you in, in, in building our teams. Uh, I do want to say that I'm not going to focus a lot on point number one, but you're definitely right that setting expectations and starting with the why. Why am I here? Why all of us are here is critical for the team success. So understand the final goal. I do want to talk about focusing on strength and why is this important. Using design thinking for relationship building and communication like there is no tomorrow. Let's start from strength. Um, I think one, I, don't, I can't remember who, but one of you mentioned um, we need to know each other's strength and focus on them. And we use the word strength all the time. What does it actually mean? What does it mean? My strength. Deep, huh? It's your thinking. So strength. Uh, I'm going to use Gallup's definition. Gallup has uh, the strengths finder assessment uh, that I can share more about it later. But I do want to say that strength, a very basic thing about strength, is what is a talent? Something we were born with, something very basic. It's the way we perceive the world. And 
if you multiply it by the investment that we invest during our life, it becomes a stress. So if I am a strategic thinker, I was born with something. There is something, you know, kind of a, a, a rooted inside me that helps me think strategically. But if I don't invest in it a long time, then it won't become a strength. And also, if I overuse it, it becomes a weakness. So this is, you know, like very, very basic 101, what is a strength? And um, Nietzsche used to say that there is no facts, only interpretation. And our strength is the way we see the world. If you think about it, in, in different team members have different strengths. And if I'm thinking of something in one way, and now team, team will know um, this is her strength, this is why she's thinking about this way, then it's going to help us communicate and do our work better, to, better together. Now, there is a lot of research, you will have it in the link in the slides. Uh, I do want to highlight two things. One, people that use their strength are three more, three x more likely to, um, to just report good quality of life and six times more likely to get to good results, measured results, business results. You can read more about it in the, um, in the article. Um, but I think it's important for our, for our conversation here. So one way, how do we learn about the strength of our team members? One way is you get all of them to take their strengths finder assessment. It's a 15 minute assessment, not a big deal. And then you can talk about it either in teams or individuals. And one thing that I really like about it, it gives you your top five strengths. And there, there is a whole thing about themes and how do you get to those strengths. But what's unique about it is that each person get the top five, which are only one in 33 million people have the same top five in the same order. Which, you know, it's almost like, a, you know, it's a very, very unique report for us. This is, um, I will call it the high maintenance way of doing things. Now there is a very low, low cost way. You're going to practice it right for a second. Um, to this team, the team that you see here. So going back to the Zoom, example that I gave you earlier. We're talking about a team that is based in different sites in the US and in Europe, and they worked together before in PayPal, right? But now they have to also integrate Zoom into PayPal. And when I joined the team, I joined, the team was already well established when I joined. When I joined the team, one thing that I've noticed is that they also, although they're saying they work agile, do you know what Agile means in a product management board? So it means that you work in sprints and we all work together. We think about the stories, what we actually want to develop in the next two weeks and then we develop them, right? So uh, although they said they work Agile, actually what they're doing is they're tossing the work across the wall from design to developers, from developers to analytics. And good luck, you know, hopefully the users will get, you, you know those um, stories about you wanted to design a chair and you got a motorcycle. Those, no, I'll, I'll find it for you later. So it's a good example of what, what we had. So in this situation, we had to use the strength finder across different teams. And we had folks from analytics, from design, from development, from product, all sitting together, going through the assessment and investing even a day in talking about it, deeply going into the details. In other situations, when I work with teams, that all I want to do is get to know them a little bit better. And that's my thing. I want to know who I'm talking with. At the beginning, right, I told you, this is me, now who are you? And of course, I can't know all about you. But I have an idea of how many product managers are here, were you born here, you know, where you're coming from, what's your culture, it gives me an idea. So it really, I would say it really depends on the situation. And let's go deeper into this at the end, okay? So we can talk one-on-one, -on -one and I can understand your situation and maybe give you a, a better example. Anything else? So you can see it's easy. I have to say, uh, many people, even after they are convinced, they feel that they feel afraid that their team is going to make fun of them for using those tools. So I really want to tell you, honestly, um, it's not this situation where you came in and you're just doing what I'm telling you to do because you're already here and why not? People, when you give them an opportunity, a framework to talk about your things, they would do it. They would love to do it. But someone needs to start. As in product managers that manage manages team, even if not directly, it's it's our job to make it happen. 
And similarly, I'm sure in your jobs as well, we can talk later one-on-one -on -one and tell me what you're doing and we can go deeply more into the details. So that's about strength. Now I want to talk about design thinking. Um, and of course, design thinking is a whole new thing, right? I, oh, not all new, but a whole other topic, which we can't really go very, very deeply into the details. I do want to talk about the core ideas, though. Um, how, are you familiar with design thinking? So I don't know where I am. Some, yes, some. some OK. So I do want to say that I think even the fact that we need to have design thinking is because of technology. It's because of where the world took us. Because when we were kids, we were design thinking all the time, right? We were going out, we were talking to people, we were empathizing in a very, very basic and simple way. And then we were building, testing, breaking, learning, right? Ideating, and then testing, and only then implementing. Okay? And now it becomes more, I mean, you will see even, even in the product, uh, product school channel, right? There, then it talks about design thinking. We should empathize with our users. It's so clear that we have to do those things. And I want to say we can use the same, same tools for our team to build our process or our team, not only our product. And um, because I can't go very deeply into this, I do want to show you another recommendation of another book. A creative Confidence. It's by the folks that built the Disco and uh, IDEO. Uh, Tom Kelly and David Kelly. They are brothers. Uh, and I want to give you an example of this cycle and how, how I actually misused it with this team. Okay, the, the same Zoom team that I'm talking about all the time. So when I joined the team, I already mentioned to, to James's question that I interviewed everyone. So I know it's a lot of time to invest at the beginning of a role, but it's something that I love doing. I'm talking to ma as many people as I can in the product team, design, analytics, or you know, whoever I work with. And I you know, just ask open questions, the same as we do in design thinking. And then what I did, so one of the things I heard from everyone is our roadmap is not clear. We don't know where we're heading, and I don't feel like it's mine. To Beth's point from earlier, it's not something that I feel responsible for. So I, and, and of course, people were all around the world, and not all around the world, Europe and, and the different sites in the US, and I thought to myself, I heard everyone, I did this distillation where I find the main issues that I hear over and over again, and I thought, oh my god, I have, I'm great, I have the solution, I have the light. I went and talked to my manager and told him, we have to do a workshop together in San Jose and bring everyone from all different sites to work together in this workshop to build the world. Okay? And the reason why I thought it's a great idea is one, because I think face-to-face -face is amazing, and second, because I thought those young developers that are sitting in other sites in the US, they would love coming to the headquarters. Right? It's almost like a gift, a free trip to San Jose. Right? Would you agree? Wrong. So what happened is that I said, you know what, just, just before you give me the budget, let me go back and ask them, right? Not only ideating, not only jumping to, a, not only jumping into a solution, but ideating, building something, asking your users, in this case my team, do you want to come to San Jose? I have to say they all look. Like, I know, you know, they all look like kids to me. So oh, kids would love to come to the headquarters, right? But actually, they were not so young. And each, each one of them had four kids at home, and they thought it's going to be a nightmare to come to San Jose. Luckily, I asked before I threw them in, right? So what we did is we went just online. We built the roadmap together, and that's the last, last point that I want to make on communicating, even if you work in a global team. And of course, it's important to communicate even if you're in the same room, but my, my, most of my experience is from global teams, so I do want to give you a few tools that I think will work great when you work in um, the same room, but also globally. So one thing is that we, we usually use in product is, besides working in sprints, is retrospective. <coughs> Do you know what retrospective is? So let's let just, Kelvin, if you can help people. Yeah, retrospective is just kind of like an inflection point, where after a sprint ends, you look back and ask what you did right, what you did wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I like about it, so I'll just repeat in case you haven't heard, it's just a stopping point where you said, this is what went well, this is what uh, didn't, went, didn't go this well, and this is what we want to do, we do different for next time. So one thing that I like to do is not talking only about what happened, 
oh, what we did, but also how we did it. How do we work as a team to make things better for our users, but also for us? And a great tool that you can use if you work remotely is a fun, fun retro. You can't really see it because I, I also kind of deleted um, what we wrote, but it's, it's you, know, just, you know, just like what Kelvin said, just online, where you can use and see. People can write their notes, uh, and you can uh, later vote and see what are the main points that are important for the team. The second thing is encourage all around communications. Some product managers, I feel mistakenly, um, think it should be a star communication. Everyone should talk to me. And I will tell you, you know, the other team, team members what they need to do. I would encourage, I know maybe we will disagree on that, but I will say it's part of, of course, you don't want to misuse it like anything else. But in the current situation and where we are today, I would say it's better to communicate more than less and share the why with your team. And lastly, um, do face-to-face, -face, even if face-to-face -face means, you know, video conferencing like we did here. Uh, I have a friend that started a company and what they do is they, every Thursday, they have a fun thing they do. They need to come with a funny hat to their video conferencing from across the world, right? So think about it, 5 a.m. here, I don't know, 2 p.m. Singapore, different funny hats. It's their thing, right? But it's hel it helps the team get closer together. And one other thing that we've done when we work remotely is using Slack for a stand-up channel with a reminder. So if it's, you know, at the end of India time, they write, this is what happened to me today. And then US time, I add, this is what happened from the product perspective today. And it's something that I found very useful for communication. But again, it's not misusing it. And it's not having people awake 2 a.m. in their, you know, early morning to discuss product stuff, which, you know, you can't really concentrate at that point. So I know those 45 minutes went by very fast, uh, but this is just a reminder of what we talked about. We started from why even bother, right? When the team is working well together, we get better results. And of course, it's fun. We all want to go to work and have fun. And um, we talked about the common dysfunctions, or if you, you know, point it the other way around, what are the main, the five most important things a team should have in order to be successful? And then we talked about practical tools for busy product managers or any other uh, occupation, actually. Um, so I know you had some questions you asked along the way, but any other questions you want to ask? Yes, Ryan. Yeah, you briefly talked about um, when you're looking at problems and trying to find solutions uh, your distillation process. Mm -hmm. uh, you maybe dive into that a little bit. That's true. Uh, I do want to say, I will dive into this, I do want to say that, I will. so what Ryan asked is, if, can I dive more deeply into the distillation process? Uh, it's actually part of the design thinking process, but I won't use the, the official design thinking process, I'll just talk about mine, okay? And I do want to say that at the presentation that I think you'll get from Brandon, uh, there are many, many other links if you want to learn more about design thinking or, uh, you know, team building, so about my personal distillation process, um, when, by the way, when I managed other people, I used to do it with them, but I will talk about one occasion when, I, when, I died, when, I, when, I done, when I've done it myself. So what I usually do is I interview, again, as many people as I can, and it takes time, but I feel it's very, very critical and important to get to know who you're talking with, and in, in a way, it saves you time. Because you don't waste time learning on your own what people are already familiar with because they've been there. And if someone only asks them, they will share the problems, right? Right out there. So I'm interviewing people and then the distillation itself is I'm sitting with my notes and, I'm, and it depends on how many information I have. If it's not a lot of information, I just sit, summarize and kind of highlight this is the five, ten things that I've heard, taking it back to the people hearing what they have to say. What should you what should be solved for you know first hand? This is one thing. If I have a lot of information, so just like in any survey that you do, I try to find the words that are repeat the patterns, that repeat, you know, the most times, and I try to number, you know, give them numbers. And when it comes to the, the topics that have you know above ten, those are the topics that I'm I'm starting to focus on. You actually like 
performance of that through software? Mm -hmm. You actually like run that through software? Like your Excel. Very basic. Excel. But yes. you can actually like do it. Yes. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a question. Do you find team building different between, say, working with 15 engineers or designers that are 15 team members who are 100% on the project mm -hmm. versus 45, uh, 45 engineers who UX service 25% of the time their time on this project, so their time share of the project? Because mm -hmm. I find it that if they're 100% on the project, it's easier to get, uh, it's easier to spend more time with them and build the team more out rather than 25% for each, from each person. Mm -hmm. then I think they sometimes you know get distracted by other priorities or other fires. But how do you if, like how do you find that difference between two kinds of team building? And your name? Uh, Donnie. Donnie. Hi Donnie. And so Donnie is asking um, what's the difference if there is any difference between when a team is one hundred percent on a project to a team that is partial time on a project, and then how do you use those tools with, the, with those teams? And I have to say that I almost. Like, thinking a year and a half back, I almost didn't work with people that are 100% dedicated to the role. It's definitely easier because people have, you know, more kind of, I don't know, mind span to invest in understanding what's the why and what are we trying to do together when they're 100% dedicated. But I will say it's actually, I think, becoming even more critical when they're not. Right? Because then you are one of the things that they're dealing with, but they have others. And then why should they invest in this? This is where the why is super important, and also feeling close to the team, I feel is critical. And depending on the situation, you can use those different tools. The thing about it, some of them, we're talking about five minutes. When you're meeting for a retro, do five minutes strength at the beginning. Right? When you are, um, it, it shouldn't be on top of other meetings that you do. It doesn't have to be on top of other meetings that you do. And the reason why I feel it's important is because it gets you to the best product. Now, you will say, some people will say you are making them headache. And why, you know, if you will do it and another product manager will do it and the third product manager will do it, then they won't have time to work. When, when we will get to this program that everyone is investing in building their teams, then you know, that's all for it. Right now, you know, if I could be very uh, egocentric for a second, if I will be the one investing in team buildings and the other won't, everyone will want to work for this product, right? And it will be more successful. Hi, is it possible to uh, share something you know, other than just putting a sense of your product you said? Okay, so Rachel is asking, uh, moving to another topic, how am I, how am I specifically dealing with prioritization? And I have to say that, funny enough, I'm using the same process with design thinking. One is that I feel everything we do should be there for a reason, should be there for something our users need. Okay? So the same process I described for team building, where we um, try to understand what's the problem the user is trying to solve. What are we solving for? What are we... Um, uh, what is the challenge, either technical or even a day-to-day -day problem that the user is facing? And then we go back and prioritize the features. If you are think, if you are saying in your situation you have different users, and then how do you prioritize? Uh, then it's a different, it's a different situation. And in that case, it sometimes go into um, in addition to what the users, or actually it's true anytime. In addition to what the user needs, is also what's true to our revenue flow for as a company and um, what will cost us more, right? So it's more of a benefit cost kind of uh, analysis that I would usually do. And um, I think it's, it will be, I don't want to, you know, because everyone didn't come for this topic, I don't want to go very deep into it, but I'm happy to talk to you about it when we're, when we'll cut this one. Yes. Yeah. How do you keep the team motivated? I understand if you're looking at a bigger company, a complete asset, like, where 
maybe one can be motivated, but but start like a small company where there are ten people who have money to only even start. You can go on the way and we have to make something important for you. What do you keep them motivated on the point? So Thank you. So one thing I want to say about that is that it's very funny because um, you can, I mean, if you ask, I'm coming from a big company now, but if you ask me, I would think, oh my god, those startup folks, they are so motivated, right? Everyone is responsible for tons of things and it's all on their shoulders. It's so difficult to keep people motivated in a big company, right? It's like you're a small piece of the puzzle. It's very difficult to move things. You have an idea and then it's only happening and executing after five years. So, um, so funny enough, I think the situation is different because you are talking specifically about team building events, I think. I want to talk about, before I go into that, I want to talk about uh, psychology. So my background is psychology and business. And there is a psychologist that I really like, and his name is Herzberg. I have no idea what his first name is, so you have to forgive me, we can Google it later. Uh, but he is talking about how do you make people motivated. He's talking about internal motivation compared to external motivation. And he talks about how um, those team activities, uh, having a great chair, having a great working environment, can make people move from feeling negatively about something to neutral. So if you give me all those stuff, I won't hate you, but I still won't be motivated internally. So to have people motivated from inside, they need to know the why, as Beth was talking about. They need to feel that they personally are invested and connected and can support whatever is the problem you're trying to solve. So I would suggest that many times the solution is actually helping them feel part of the team, part of the solution. And if you are into team building events, I have to say, you know, just buy some groceries, bring them together to a kitchen, have them cook together, right? That's not costing a lot of money. It's a great team building activity. I would just say that this on its own won't get the team motivated and excited to move them from you know, negative to neutral. Yes. Um, Do we have time, Brandon? I have no idea what we have. Okay. It's, it's great. I've heard that the company is more remote. Uh, so the town people can spend more time on their house or the game. How long? Big companies and small companies. You can share a lot of to wherever by the end of the game. In your home, and they only interact with you at least to the camera and the code. Sometimes it's a bit hard because you can be motivated when you, when you have your blog that you can share with you kudos to the slide and the parallel. So, open and being people motivated in this special, in the company is fully remote. Okay. Uh, I, have, I mean, I think your questions are what's your name? Christian. Christian. So, Christian is asking how can you keep people motivated when they are remote, when most of the company is remote. I think each one of your questions is a topic for uh, you know, a whole conversation on its own. I will give one example of my own. So, I worked with one team that um, most of the team members were remote. What we've done um, is we try to keep them motivated by solving a problem that they are facing. So one of the things we learned is because people are remote from each other, you know, many people are coming to work wanting to not only, you know, contribute to the why of the company, but also they want to develop themselves, right, and their skill sets. And what we've learned is when you sit alone in your home, you can't really develop your skills unless you have, the, you know, a very good passion to online learning, which we know, you know, many people are starting courses but never finishing them because we do want these interactions with other people. So what we've done is we used, uh, we built a program, we called it the skill sketcher. We used the strength finder to match people together. So if I'm strong at strategic thinking, you are strong in operations, and I want to learn operation, you want to learn strategy, we match those folks together and we have them work one-on-one -on -one on those problems, on those things they want to develop. And in addition to that, we had some things where they met few pairs together, and this is how we build a team, right? So first we work one-on-one, -on -one, 
and then we put few pairs together and they have discussion on the topic and then when we all came together as a team you don't feel remote anymore right so it's more it's more about solving something that the person wants to be solved for him or herself this is just one example of some of a tool you could use Okay, so I guess it, it varies um, uh, from an individual company. So for, uh, for me, I think like a PM requires uh, different collaboration and communication with different departments. So sometimes you need to like work on roadmaps, talk to support to executives, and also like set up demos with clients. So a lot of the time you actually uh, are taken and then you just have those priorities there. So, like for me, I think like team building is kind of put at a lower priority. It's kind of like in a day-to-day -day activity, but you cannot really like quantify how much time you spend on like building the team. So I guess my question would be like, what percent of the time, or how would you actually manage your time in terms of putting into building the team yourself? And your name? Hennis. Hennis. So Hennis is asking, were you here at the beginning? No. Uh, no. I missed your intro. Okay. And so, you know what? Let me get back to you when we're, if this is the last question, and let, let's talk. Because we talked about it at the beginning, and I'm, I want to be, you know, sensitive to it once time. Okay? So, any other question? Yes. I'm not sure if it's fault to talk My question is, let's see Some other team come and say, hey, we can do this, but this falls on the real of money. Who do you handle this? Like this, this. And you want to build it or you don't want to build yeah, it? We want to build it as a company. Uh huh. And this falls on the real of money. Uh -huh. some, other, some other team has come and said, you will do it. You will do it. And, and as a product manager, I want my team to build it or no? Yeah, I want it to see. Okay, so th see, this is a problem for a big company, right? Corporation. Uh, you have many people. Sometimes teams, they all want to build the same thing. Sometimes no one want to build another thing. Sorry, what's the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, the question. And your name? Rakesh. Rakesh. So Rakesh is asking, were they ever part of a situation where my team is with my? We want to build something that is part of my domain of my team, but there is another team saying they want to build. it. Now, I have to hear more details about this specific situation. One, of course, I was part of the situation. I was part of a situation where my team wanted to build something, another team wanted to build it. I was part of a situation where my team didn't want to build something, and no one else wanted to build it too, but it was very important. I think eventually, I mean, people, 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 it's all team building, all super important. Eventually, we're here for a goal and for a reason, and we all work for a company. So if it needs to be built, Someone will have to build it. Specifically on this situation, I have to say, you know, I'll start by talking, understanding why does the other team want to build something that is in my domain. Um, I'll try to listen to them. Eventually, depending on the situation, on the budget, on the cost, on the goal, on other things that I have to do, you know, going back to Rachel on the prioritization, then we'll decide together. And I don't want to oversimplify it and say it's my domain, I'll build it, go away. Right? I'm assuming there is more to it, and so let's talk about it. And I guess in a few minutes. So there's another suggestion here that it depends on the incentives. It also depends on the culture of the company, right? Because in Apple, you're saying they'll build it a few times, they'll decide what to kill according to what's best. At PayPal, we go more on, let's talk about it before we go into it. Yeah, I think I like your solution because it's basically one that you're saying, <coughs> because you can't build it. Because you just don't want to say, okay, you can just build it, you don't do it. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they do love them, but maybe they, have some other way 
the form and so on. I think that I I want to I assume, some more data points. Yeah. I'll just say I'm not I'm not saying that because I want I'm, I'm going to avoid offending them because again we we all should be of course they might be offended, but we're all professionals, we want to get the job done. I do want to ask why, like why do they think they can do it better? And maybe they can, maybe they can't, maybe right? They can. Um, how do you uh, basically you have a your higher up who wants something done, delivered a certain budget at a certain date? How do you uh, bring that back to reality? Mm -hmm. In that scenario, yeah. I, I like that. I'm assuming it's I, I, I want they want it sooner than later. Yes. Okay. Yes, their demands are. <laughs> Yeah. So I think one of the things that I like to do is be honest. And I have to say, my engineering team that I work with sometimes call me I'm too honest, like too naive. Because they say, why? I mean, just think how much time it will take, double it, and then communicate, right? And I try not to do that. And sometimes it's painful for me and the team. But people that work with me for a you know, longer time know that what I'm saying will be delivered. And if for some reason the leader wanted earlier, I'm trying to understand why. I can give you an example. Uh, something Equi was just launched, the PayPal um, new payments button. So we worked on one piece of it, the insights, the seller's insights. And you can read about it, amazing for us. Um, but I will say that um, our director wanted to be launched. So we, we went from ideation to launch in, in less than three months. And the reason was that they wanted it was part of a huge deal that they had, and they needed they needed the you know they needed the press, they needed the communication. So what we did is we negotiated, we prioritized the features. And we said, okay, if it's the timeline, let's talk about what we're doing. If the timeline is something you can move, let's talk about the timeline. And, but I tried to be very very realistic about how much time it will really take, and I'm building my reputation right that when I'm saying it will be delivered, it will. But I will never tell you it will take less because what's happened, what I really, really hate, and I heard many times in the interview that I've done, is that product managers, well, I have to show you that. I was hoping I would have a reason to show you that, and now I have, so I have to. Do you notice? Know have you seen this before? It's just awesome. I had to find a reason. Um, so you see how um, product managers, you know, as seen by product managers, how they seen by developers, right? So you see how developers see product managers? So one of the things I've heard many times in interviews is, of course, these product managers, he or she goes, talk to the executives, give me a date, and now I need to chase after the date, right? I'm the one developing it. So what I try to do every time is never commit to a date before I work with the team to understand what's a date. And if I get a date, from you wanted to say something? Very good idea. And if, if I get a date from executives, again, I go with the why that Beth gave us to the team and try to figure out what can we deliver. I will never commit to a date before I talk to the team. Yeah, so quick follow up on that. Um, how bare of a product and the features on it can you deliver on top? How? So, like, um, like, I guess how minimal product if they want all these features and yeah. say, okay, you can have these three instead uh -huh. of these twelve. How do you balance I think, that? I think don't okay. just like don't a have, task or yeah, what? so I, I think it was Jeff Bezos, I'm not sure, that said that if you launched your first MVP and you're not totally embarrassed, then you're too late. And I really like this sentence because I truly think that I mean it shouldn't be ugly, right? But this will be basic functionality to test if you're even going in the right direction. And um, I hope he the one said that. If not, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. If you're so you won't have to. Sound good. Sound good, right, Jeff Bezos? Find it, yeah. It's a good quote. <laughs>